Welcome back to the Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Jamie Leverton of Hut 8 and Asher Ganoon of US Bitcoin to discuss the proposed merger between the two companies. We talk about US Bitcoin's operations, the two companies' discrete assets, and the purchases of Compute North's sites by US Bitcoin. Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provide top technical training for mining technicians in the US. This essential academy course offered by Foundry will take place in Rochester, New York, from June 26th through the 30th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering micro-soldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Got a great episode today. There was a big Bitcoin mining merger a few months ago. You guys might have heard about it. And today we have the privilege of talking to the two heads of that merger. We don't have everybody on, but we got two pretty good people to talk about it. Uh, Jamie Leverton of Hot 8 and Asher Gnut of US Bitcoin. Welcome both to the show today. Thanks guys for joining. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. So there's a lot to cover. We only have so much time, uh, but we're really going to focus in on the operation side of things for today's discussion. Uh, there's You guys have both posted some information. We just talked about that a second ago before we started recording. There's there's lots of information about like the shares and how like a reverse merger works and all that. Uh, so if you are interested, do feel free to go to these guys' websites and check that information out. What we really want to get out of this podcast uh, for listeners is like, how is this going to work since you guys are two different businesses in two different countries, two different lines of revenue? Uh, there's, very, there's a lot of similarities, obviously, a lot of similarities, but it is like a combination of powers that I think caught some people by surprise and they looked into a little bit more and were like pleasantly pleased by what is going on here. So first, I'm going to throw it up to Jamie. Uh, can you just lay out what's going on with this merger uh, from like 10,000 feet for those who are not familiar? And then we'll start getting into the specifics. Yeah. So happy, happy to do it. Uh, and thanks for having me back. It's always, it's always good to be here. Um, we have been very public since we closed the, our initial inorganic uh, growth transaction all of, just over a year ago, we closed on the acquisition of our HPC. Uh, business, so five high performance computing traditional data centers across Canada, two in Toronto, two in Vancouver, uh, one in Northern BC and Kelowna. And that was our first really significant foray into a truly diversified fiat based revenue stream. But I, I remained uh, committed to driving a growth trajectory within the HUD 8 business. Um, using a combination of organic and inorganic growth. So uh, I don't think it really surprised anybody when we announced our our uh, intention to go into uh, another transaction and ultimately the, um, the, the, the best dance partner we believe out there is USDPC and, and that, that's why we, we uh, decided to go into this merger. Uh, Mike and Asher and I have known each other for uh, just over a year now. We, we really, really respect the businesses that we, that we build. We have very similar strategic vision, very similar corporate cultures, and all of that led to us really trying to find a way to work together. And then, and as we grew our businesses and diversified our businesses over time, uh, the opportunity to bring them together, um, just couldn't have made more sense. And we really see this as an opportunity where it's, it's not a one plus one equals two. It's really a one plus one equals three. As I've talked about before, we didn't build synergies into the model because we really think what each of us are bringing to the table is complementary. There is very little overlap, but I've built a diversified business with a very um, conservative kind of balance sheet forward approach. Uh, Mike and Asher have built a business that's equally diversified, albeit in different ways. So. Uh, at, here at Hot, we went down the the path of an HPC business that that was our diversification strategy. I'll let Asher talk about their diversification strategy. Um, but really, when we think about bringing these businesses together, Hot was a Canadian only um, entity. All of our operational assets are in Canada. Uh, USBTC, all of their operational assets are in the US. We both have diversified models, but with different business lines. 
so really when you think about how how the business comes together how it how it maps and and ultimately meshes it's very 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 synergistic without uh being in any way overlapping or uh destructive of value love that yeah same question over to you asher maybe like a a snapshot of the assets that uh, you're currently working with, the aspirations for the company. And, you know, I guess to really um, draw back a little bit more, we haven't had you guys on the podcast yet. So like, you know, some foundation stories would be interesting as well. No, thanks for having us on and really appreciate the time. US Bitcoin was really started by me and Mike with the idea and the mindset that three things were really happening when COVID hit the world and we were in the peak of 2020. Number one, everyone living in a digital world on Zoom, converting out of the office. And we believe that the thesis of a digital store of value could really gain traction amongst a whole subset of individuals that couldn't really make that psychological shape. So that was the first thing. Second is with the actual semiconductor chips, you were having this plateau in Moore's Law where the efficiency cycle by cycle were decreasing. And now you can run the miners for an elongated period of time and really deploy institutional capital. And then lastly, which our team nerds out about all the time is how Bitcoin mining really is, it's just, an, it's just another way to manage energy. And for us and a big driver coming into the space was there is so much renewable being built and being supported by different institutions, by the government. And a lot of those renewables are being built in areas that frankly don't have as much demand like West Texas. And the transmission systems aren't actually built today yet. And so this creates a heavy amount of curtailment and negative pricing and just inefficient markets because they're driven by tax credits. That's the real reason they're being built. And by creating agile loads to help balance that grid, we felt like this was a perfect trisection between the three to be able to really grow mining at scale in an institutional way. So I mean, when we started the business, we ran one facility up in Niagara Falls and we really started at the bottom. We were on site deep within every wrap, plugging in miners. And at this time in the market, I mean, these pieces of software that exist today didn't exist, right? And so when a miner was off, we would run around the facility looking for this red blinking light of what miner is off. And that's really what's driven our growth is because we would sit in an office and go, this can't be how it's done. It doesn't make sense. Imagine if we're running 10,000 machines, 100,000 machines, this is not scalable. And I think that's where the driver for a lot of where our business and where our focus has, has come from is because we've been in this field and the uh, majority of the management team I had working on site when they started at the company, no matter what their backgrounds are. So for example, Sam Gager, SVP of operation, he was a uh, head of the basketball team at the University of Chicago, went into the investment banking private equity world. And when I hired him, I'm like, Sam, I know you're smart. I know you understand how to understand the financials of the business, how to run it. But can you get in the dirt with me and really run these facilities and really build these data centers and mean roll up your sleeves? And he said, look, I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. I'll do the tough work. And I think that's really the background of most of our team across the board is everyone's been in the nuances of how to actually operate these machines. So now at this point at scale, we're managing over 700 megawatts of aqua load, over 200,000 machines. Everyone understands the high level issues on how do we manage the business well, how do we fiduciary responsible, how do we manage risk, but also how much is a core cost? Why do these internet wires have issues on the Ethernet force? Should we use static or dynamic IPs? I think that's what's driven a lot of the focuses that we have in building our software stack and building the energy management piece and creating SOPs and really building the foundation layer that's allowed us to scale very, very quickly, especially over the last six months where there's been a lot of volatility in the market. And I mean, we brought on an extra 500 megawatts of expansion and load through that period of time. Yeah. One thing that uh, we definitely should bring up is that you guys were sort of the winners of like the post-market crash, you know, Compute North went under, unfortunately, and there was like a lot of stuff with their chapter 11 case. You guys came in and purchased a lot of those assets and accelerated your growth like very quickly, as far as I understand it. And definitely correct me if I'm wrong there. Tell me a little bit about those assets that you guys scooped up. And then also tell me about the assets that you already had on hand and how those came together to the fuel where your business is at the moment? Sure. So in the last six months, I would say it was a hard time for everybody, ourselves included. Before the markets really turned, 
we have always focused on operational excellence. That's what we felt like was going to be our competitive advantage. When you think about Bitcoin mining, what I love about it is your revenue is hash price. That's not just Bitcoin price. That's network rewards, and most importantly, that's difficulty. So as long as you're competing at the highest echelons, when Bitcoin prices go down, other miners will have to shut down, and then your hash price will go back, back up. Right? And so there's a stabilization mechanism where our destiny is not what is Bitcoin, right? So that has a very big impact on how we perform, but our destiny is how do we compete amongst others in the ecosystem that are mining as well? What is our operational efficiency? What is our cost of energy? What is the capex we can deploy to build? And what does our look like, IRR look like over time? And so when the markets were running and we were in a very bullish state, Frankly, it was hard to get that messaging across in terms of how well we were operating our sites, how well we were managing energy. And when the markets turned and the margins compressed, it became very, very clear on who was swimming naked and who was fully clothed when, when the water line proceeded. And so for us, going into this period of time where a lot of miners went through a hard time, there were bankruptcies and still are bankruptcies that, that are lying, we have a ton of respect for the Compute North team, for horizontally for all these folks. And with Compute North specifically, there were two things that happened. The first was Generate Capital, which was a lender in the Compute North bankruptcy. They credit bid on the two facilities, one in Carney, Nebraska, and one in Granbury, Texas. And their background and why they had loaned money to the project in the first place is they believed in that energy narrative. Their clean energy renewable fund based on San Francisco and they really believe that Bitcoin mining could help with the curtailment issues that renewable sources have. And so when they were faced with the situation of a bankruptcy that came up that they didn't really have foresight to, and now they had to manage 400 megawatts of active load. And at that point, Granbury was not even energized. There was a small little pilot 15 megawatts online, but 300 megawatts were not energized. Air Con Alvada proved it at the time. They were looking for an operator and a partner to come on and help them run the business in the facilities. And so today, as a part of our mining operations business, it's, we call it USMIO. What we do for them is we manage the facilities, we manage expansion, the electrical issues, networking issues, customer support, bringing on new customers, accounting, uh, finances, audits, legal. So really an A to Z solution for them to be able to own this site without having to build a mining team from the ground up. And because of how efficient we've gotten, we believe that this service is a win-win because it allows them to rely on a partner that is actually executed and at a cost that would be similar, if not more, would be similar, if not less than if they were to do it themselves. They probably would have to pay more because they'd have to go through the learning uh, exercise. And then the second site that we purchased in the bankruptcy was the King Mountain site with a very, very large renewable company that their name has kind of been across the board that people have seen. It's a 280 megawatt site. It's a behind the meter uh, plant and a wind farm. And we own 50% of that project with that energy partner. And so that's an extremely exciting opportunity for us because a reason they came into the space and meeting with the former CEO, he had brought up that he believes the biggest issue in risk acting at renewable project space like wind and solar is curtailment. Because so many people are building these projects. All this energy is producing at the same time when the sun is shining or when the wind is blowing. And then you have these congested nodes. If you go, look, a lot of times it's negative pricing because if you're getting paid 20 or $30 a megawatt hour on the tax subsidy, you're okay losing $10 a megawatt hour when you're running because there's a delta. And so they had believed that these sites could help. And so the last, I mean, five, six months, we brought on 600 megawatts of load and we really, really rolled up our sleeves. And I couldn't be more thankful for the team that we created and the infrastructure that we created. But the software stack that we have on the operator side, we, the energy management uh, stack that we've created, we've been able to take all of these sites fully operational, fix all of the issues that have existed there. We onboarded our team, brought on about 80 uh, team members from these individual sites. So retain all of the employees on these sites. No one lost their jobs. We've gone through and gone through a training program. And right now we're optimizing the sites and getting them more and more efficient. The Granbury site brought the 15 megawatts. Today, we're bringing it fully up to the past and 300 megawatts that have been built. So the last six months have been a struggle, but for the ecosystem and for us, so we've been very grateful to play our part and be able to help some of these partners that we've uh, 
growing these relationships with. Thanks for that summary there. Uh, I love the the part about keeping the jobs because I think that's been sort of lost in the narrative of Bitcoin mining going through like a, a down cycle. I think a lot of people have been thinking about this as being something that's like catastrophic, but a lot of smart operators and players have been able to pick up the pieces and keep things moving along. Uh, JB, you're not getting out of this. We got to turn towards you. When, <laughs> when, when people think about HUT8, I think they think of a few things. One, they don't sell Bitcoin. Two, conservative growth. And three, you guys are up in Canada. Tell me a little bit about how those three pieces and whatever else you think about HUD-8 personally, how that fits into what everything uh, uh, we were just talking about there with Asher. Yeah, I mean, I think we're the first publicly traded company to hold Bitcoin on balance sheet, so it's absolutely part of our DNA. I know uh, Michael Saylor made it famous through MicroStrategy, but we were, have actually been doing it back uh, since 2018. So certainly HODL is part of our narrative. It's part of our DNA. That's not going to go away. Uh, We were very bullish um, during the bull market on not selling our stack and really preserving um, that value on our balance sheet. So we we remain with over 9,000 self-mined Bitcoin on our balance sheet. It it is unencumbered to this day. we at, uh, upon the announcement of this merger, we are out. Uh, we're out of the capital market, so we and we're continuing to take a very conservative approach to debt. Uh, as as our um, shareholders or people that follow us know, we've got a, a small infrastructure backed loan, uh, but really that's all. So as we as we go through the period of approvals required for this merger. Um, we want to, we, we've been selling our production and the, the Bitcoin that we produce on a monthly basis in order to continue to cash flow the business while we go through these approvals. We, uh, we press released over the last few weeks that um, we're very fortunate. We've received competition bureau approval from both sides of the border and, and we still have to finish our, our remaining regulatory approval and then ultimately um, our shareholder vote, but we're still uh, optimistic that the transaction can be closed by uh, by the end of Q2, and then as we as we merge the two entities together, we'll take we'll take a, a an active approach to how we manage Treasury going forward. But certainly um, maintaining the stack and having HODL as a portion or as a part of our narrative will continue to be be core to who we are, and we think that it's a big reason that we've had the optionality that we had. That we have had to take advantage of the bear market um, in a, in a different but similar way to to how Mike and Asher have been able to capitalize on these market conditions. So, um, for those for those people that are that are worried that we're gonna sell the whole stack down and and become contrary to our DNA, that 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 isn't the case. That's not the plan of record. Uh, we just we believe our balance sheet allows us to do a transaction that we think is meaningful. Um, and will drive the longest term value um, to to all parties involved, and and this is the right partner for us. And um, we are, as you mentioned, we're we're one of the the only scaled miners that remains uh, entirely Canadian based. Uh, and as as the market evolves, obviously we see a lot of um, regulatory discussion on both sides of the border. And I think for a player the size that we are looking to continue to drive an aggressive growth mandate and make sense to have not just um, diversification from a revenue line perspective, which which both of our companies have established and talked about, but geographic diversification as well. So I think it serves both parties to have uh, a significant presence north of the border and south of the border. Uh, and I would say we continue to look at other markets uh, globally as well. And I think I think there's a ton of opportunity uh, for for growth in this market. One of the things I absolutely love and am very bullish on, with respect to what Mike and Asher built, is the MIO business that um, that Asher touched on. I think we're going to see continued demand for people that want that expertise to just come in, really turnkey, to run managed sites, to bring their purpose-built software that can help optimize sites really out of the gate right down to a minor level uh, i think i think it's a really nothing going to be a growing marketplace for us the the us btc team is the has, is the category creator not just the category leader uh, and i think that demand profile is just going to continue to grow at not just in north america but but globally and and certainly 
the teams in the best position to capture that that as we see that um, that trend unfold. Love that. I'm gonna turn a little bit of what you're talking about there and hand it over to Asher. Tell me about how like these multitudes of business lines are going to like converge into one company. It sounds like a operational headache just from my personal standpoint, but it is also like makes you guys strong, right? And you can like withstand a lot of different pressures that Bitcoin miners historically have been sunken by, right? Like Bitcoin mining is so cyclical, yet you guys are hosting, you guys are managing, you guys have data center services. But to Asher, yeah, how are you thinking about managing and integrating all these business lines? So from a US Bitcoin perspective, our operations are fairly simple. We manage every site as if we own the site and we manage it to the highest regard. In terms of how the economics flow, as you mentioned, there are three pieces. We have our self-mining fleet, which has exposure to Bitcoin price and network difficulty. And that drives very high in terms of what Bitcoin runs and profitability increases. And that gets impacted on the reverse as well. The second revenue stream is from hosting. So we'll host clients on a multitude of structures, a fixed hosting rate that we have often on the other side pass through power with an add-on or some process share split or hash price uh, derivative. And then the third platform that uh, we have in terms of revenue stream is our USMIO business. And that's a property management business, right? So if you, the analogy I like to use is if you think about Marriott or Wilhelton, they historically had owned the properties and they had their managing business as well. And then back in now, uh, the early 2000s, late 90s, they split those businesses apart. And now you have the real estate owner and then you have Marion Pope, and I really became a property manager business. And so each three of these businesses have different types of revenue streams that are more or less correlated with Bitcoin price, like the property management division. We get paid every single month, no matter what. So in a more bearish situation, we have enough to continue to manage through that cycle, and we have a floor in what our revenue streams are. At the same time, each three of these categories requires a different type of CapEx that needs to be invested in order to build that division, right? So the USMIO division, it's primarily our ability to operate the technology stack that we've created in terms of operating our facilities, the technology stack that we've created in terms of managing the miners and the energy trading that we have, that is a very strong focus of our business. And then the other two hosting is a capital intensive, specifically on the infrastructure side that from an investor standpoint, it's a little less risky when it comes to the ASIC side and a little less volatile. And then you have the full exposure to self-mining. And so as we think about growing and building a business as well, is thinking about these as different financing engines as part of the macro business and being able to continue to grow in a risk-adjusted way and in a diversified manner. So from our ops team, it's very simple. We have our facilities, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, they manage it as if we own it. They don't care if it's a US amount of business, it's a self miner, it's a hosting business. The folks on the, on the site, they don't differentiate a miner as US Bitcoin or uh, client A or B. And so they operate everything under the same principles and the same regards. And I think from a corporate structure perspective, we want to be able to maximize out upside when Bitcoin was running and be able to protect against downside as well. And so a big part that we're very, very excited for in this HUD 8 merger is the traditional data centers that HUD has purchased in those five data centers. We recently had a client that was visiting our Delta facility and they were looking at installing five to 15 megawatts of AI compute behind the meter at a Bitcoin mining facility. So continued diversification, we believe is very important. And at our core, Bitcoin mining is taking electrons and converting them into a more valuable asset, which we believe is Bitcoin. And so over time, we'll look at what are other ways we can convert these electrons and continue to grow in a way that's diversified and we're suggesting that gives our appropriate stakeholders the upside when the markets run, but also the protection and diversification when we're in a very more bearish state. Love that. Jamie, anything to add there? I'm personally curious about how you think about the uh, data management sites or the, the data sites that you guys have talked about for so long and been managing. Yeah, so I think uh, my my worldview is obviously a little bit biased based on my background. I spent um, over 20 years in the, in the traditional technology space, much of it focused on infrastructure, traditional data centers, cloud managed services. Uh, so when I came into the into the Bitcoin mining side of the world, which really is is just an industrial scale data center, the the operational motion at its core is very very similar. 
and I my my belief is over time we'll see a continued uh, convergence of your traditional kind of web two trad tech type of infrastructure offering and the and the digital asset or Bitcoin mining kind of really really scale uh, compute with a a laser focus on keeping opex as low as possible. I think these worlds will continue to kind of come together over time. And uh, my belief is at Hot Eight, and ultimately us as a as a merged entity, uh, assuming that uh, we get all the approvals required uh, for that to become the case. I think there's nobody better positioned globally that really understands natively both worlds of like a trad tech web two infrastructure data center world, and then everything that that is being built in a uh, in a digital asset or a web three infrastructure world. And the, as that convergence comes over time, I think we're really uniquely positioned to continue to be on the leading edge of that convergence and really driving a value proposition to all of our con constituents, whether it's customers or shareholders or the ecosystem in general. And I, I am obviously very passionate about the, the vision I see of ultimately all of these worlds coming together um, and scale a uh, scaled compute offering becoming necessary, whether it's ASICs or GPUs, regardless of workload, we're going to need to see this kind of dynamic scaled offering approach uh, more widely available uh, in, in many, many jurisdictions. Love it. Yeah, I feel like the, the chat GBT stuff has been like inkling into Bitcoin mining a little bit. People are starting to think about like the AI infrastructure. Okay, we've got to get some market commentary as we close out the show. Where are we in terms of hash rate by the end of the year? Uh, it's it's almost the end of March right now, so I think it's fair to ask this question a few more times, but then we'll we'll close out the poll for the rest of the year. But do you guys have any guesses on December thirty first, twenty twenty three? Where are we going to be at? Uh, look, I, I I won't speak for Asher because I don't know actually know his position on this. I don't make uh, predictions on Bitcoin price or hash rate. If I ever had before, I would have been so wrong. <laughs> um. And uh, and the way we run our our business internally is hands and sensitivities, and we try to make sure uh, that we're we have the opportunity and again building out a diversified model in the way that that we have and we see an emerged world where we can really we've got the optionality to flex uh, in and out of business lines to flex where we put our put our capex where we put our marketing focus based on how these dynamics continue to change because there, I don't think there's a more dynamic um, workload on the planet than what we see in, in Bitcoin mining and digital assets today. And our opportunity to flex in and out, I think is one of our critical key advantages. So I'm not gonna make any predictions. My job is to make sure uh, that we can weather all potential scenarios and are building a business that, uh, that can do that uh, regardless of market cycles and uh, for the for the test of time. No forward-looking statements. I understand because they're, <laughs> they're public. Not sure, you're you're not quite public yet, or you guys are public, right? I know we're not. We're not yet. Not yet. So you can make statements, right? And so my perspective in <laughs> my perspective is similar to Jamie's. When I get asked a question, my response is if I know or if I have what gut feeling that I could predict, I would go into trading rather than operating <laughs> massive scale facilities. But the way that we look at it historically, so when we bought our first washable machines, when we were building out our facilities, they were under $20 a care hash, right? And then throughout the bull cycle, we purchased machines under $35 a care hash. We never went above. And when people were purchasing the 60, 70 days, $80 per care hash, I mean, frankly, that's how we raised a lot of money along the way. People really didn't understand how we were doing it. It was one due to our understanding of the market and the cyclicality around and how we purchase at the right times. And then two is relationships that we built over the years with the manufacturers. When we think about network hash rate, I mean, the way that we solve for it is there's three main manufacturers of these machines. They buy manu they buy chips from three main foundries. And so if you really understand the supply chain, you can understand how many machines may be hitting the market, right? And all, every public miner discloses what they're buying, how they're purchasing. And in a gross market, that's how we predict where is hash rate going to go and what are we willing to purchase today for a machine and what does that payback look like? In today's world, 
you've had the last six months of distressed miners sitting in boxes that for the most part we believe have been purchased and all are in the process or have already found the home, right? The manufacturers have toned down the amount of machines that they're building due to the current demand. And so there's, when thinking about this, we think about it from two perspectives. From an operating perspective, we can't control what is going to happen with Bitcoin price and we can't control what's going to happen with cash price. What we can control is how strong are we comparative to our peers and how strong are we going to be able to ride through that cyclicality. And from a CapEx perspective, really looking at that deeper analysis, as JD mentioned, a lot of data analysis spreadsheets that go behind it, but looking through that analysis and figuring out when is the right time to buy the right model of miner with a specific efficiency at a certain cost. And so that uh, analysis becomes really, really important when we're deploying capital and looking at how do we minimize our risk and increase upside. The spreadsheets, I love that. Uh, I don't run a public company, and that's probably why I have a podcast. And it's because I, I never learned the spreadsheets, and I, I probably never will. But hey, thank but, you. Go ahead. Sorry, I I will just file on a little bit. It's it. Uh, we are sitting in a position of luxury, being deep in a bear in a bear market, talking about efficiency, talking about conservative um, capital deployment strategies, uh, having sat in this chair as a public company CEO in the bull market. There was a lot of there was a lot of pressure to deploy capital into that very high price environment because people were getting rewarded for big extra hash headlines. I was under a ton of pressure for being overly conservative. I faced a lot of heat for um, many people that I didn't believe in the super cycle, which was a bit of a theme in the peak bull. Um, so I think that having a level of kind of you know discipline and conviction. Um, commitment to ultimately your fiduciary responsibility, which is not always going to be popular. You're not always going to be right. Um, but it, it, uh, it's, a, it's not an easy, it's not an easy line, uh, to continue to cover yeah. to navigate. And they adding one more piece to that. I know we're, we're not letting you finish, but <laughs> no, <you're good. laughs> I love it. I, I, look, I was trained in the school of thought of value investing. And it's being a contrarian is okay, as long as you're right, right? And so to Jamie's point, when the market is running, capital wants to join, everyone wants to purchase machines, build out facilities, and it's very expensive. It's expensive to buy machines and expensive to build. And so when Bitcoin was sitting under 20,000, we just saw it as a great time to just put our heads down and build and purchase when things were cheap. Similar when Bitcoin drops, the believer here is saying, it's a great time for me to buy Bitcoin and auto because when the markets runs, I'll have buying at a lower rate. And so for us, when the markets are in conditions where they are now, plus or minus 20,000, it's an it's the right type for us to continue to scale and not hold back and retract and be scared. And also structuring in a way for investors that join where they're protected as well. And so they're comfortable deploying capital and the whole market is blowing away. Well, I'll just add, I'll add one last commentary then I Keep going. Will I, will I, you wrap it up? I'll keep the, you guys um, all day. It's the other way around, trust me. <laughs> We're, we're not going to be right all the time. We're in a nascent industry. We're trying to make the most educated decisions possible, keeping in mind all of the con constituents involved. But at the end of the day, we cannot predict the future. There's so many parts of this business that we don't control. It continues to be, and it is a risk asset class. So um, we, we do the absolute best we can. We try to take a conservative approach. We, we try to skate where the puck is going. I'm a Canadian. I'm going to have to come up with a new analogy. Um, but uh, we're not always going to get it right. So I think I think it's important for people to recognize that we're, we are human. We're doing the best we can with just a crazy amount of variables and a, and a, ton, of, a ton of ice. And uh, I'm super proud of the team that we've built. I'm very, very bullish on Asher and Mike and his team. And I think our union is going to be uh, the most beautiful marriage, but um, yeah, we're not perfect. Love that. I mean, US Bitcoin's Southern California based, right? So you guys are going to have to figure out. Uh, we're in the uh, beautiful city of Miami. Oh, you're in Miami. Okay. So wrong, right. wrong coast, but still s similar sports. Maybe you can like figure that one out. Something. I don't know. I'm going to see Mike for dinner or Asher for dinner tomorrow. We're going to have to come up with a, with a cross border and anal sport analogy. For me. There we go. There you go. Hey, Jamie, Asher, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Hopefully see you guys again soon. For everyone listening, give us a like, subscribe. Uh, also tweet about the show if you have any questions for either of them. You can find them 
on Twitter where I think most people in Bitcoin are spending most of their days. So again, <laughs> Jamie Asher, thank you so much. Great, great to be here. Thanks again for having me.